Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm Kevin Keller, the CEO of CFP Board. This is CFP Board's Certificate Connection webinar, and it's a part of the series that up until this point, we've been calling our Business Update webinars, uh, and the new title we think better aligns these webinars with the series of in-person meetings that we do, which are called Certificate Connections as well as our podcast. All of these are designed to share the latest updates from CFP Board and provide opportunities for CFP Board's leadership to connect and engage with the CFP professional community and our many other stakeholder groups. Today, we are uh, broadcasting from CFP Board's headquarters in Washington, D.C. During the presentation, you'll get an update on our work to strengthen our enforcement processes. We'll take a look at our work to implement the new Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct, which takes effect October 1st and will be enforced beginning June 30th of 2020. And we'll share with you CFP Board's work to expand the public's access to competent and ethical financial planning. At the end of our prepared remarks, we will devote uh, time to answering your questions, so please contribute those and your thoughts to us during today's program. Before we get into our presentation, let me cover a few housekeeping items. If you run into issues with the audio portion of this presentation, or if it seems like the slides have somehow gotten out of sync with what we're saying, please refresh your webinar console. There's a Q&A function on your screen that you can use to submit questions to us at any time during the program. We'll address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the program. And if we don't get to your question today, CFP Board will follow up and provide an answer to you. Uh, with me here this afternoon are two accomplished CFP professionals, our chair of the board, Susan John, and Jack Brode, who is chair-elect, who will serve as chair of the board in 2020. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Susan, why don't you, uh, you know, I want to talk about our enforcement process. But we just finished uh, quite a, a quite a couple of busy days on the nominating process. I mean, I think folks might be interested to hear just a little bit about how that process goes. You know, I think we have a pretty good process, Kevin. And uh, the last couple of years, we've had an extraordinary number of very well qualified individuals um, submit their applications for consideration for board service. Um, uh, we had over 70 applicants this year alone for just a couple of seats that are coming available at the end of this year. We're always looking for a real diversity of opinion among our certificates. We really take the whole question of diversity very seriously, um, looking at all aspects of diversity on the board. And uh, it's always amazing to me how many people step forward to offer their experience and their wisdom for service on the board. Well, Susan, you know, the topic of the day is enforcement of our code and ethics, so why don't you jump right in? Well, thanks, Kevin. Um, as Kevin mentioned, CFP Board's new Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct takes effect next month. Setting and enforcing ethical standards for CFP professionals is one of CFP Board's most important responsibilities, and it's a central part of our work to maintain the value, integrity, and relevance of CFP certification. The process of developing the new code and standards was a long one. It was back in December of 2015 that we started the process with the formation of the Commission on Standards. We took a deliberative and thorough approach that included active outreach to gather input on proposed revisions from CFP professionals and from the public. We wanted to get it right, and all of us on the board are very pleased at the result. At the same time, we also knew 
that we needed to revisit CFP Board's processes for enforcing our standards. That process made good headway in 2018 as we released a draft of proposed procedural rules for public comment last November. The new rules were designed to consolidate and replace our current disciplinary and appeal rules, and they were drafted to be consistent with the new code and standards. We plan to have final procedural rules in place upon the October 2019 effective date of the new code and standards. And at about the same time, the board was considering what we expected to be a final draft of the procedural rules. The Wall Street Journal was developing a story critiquing our enforcement and disclosure processes. I'm sure many of you read the recent Wall Street Journal article focused on CFP Board's disclosure and enforcement process. The article pointed out that while CFP Board's websites share information about CFP Board disciplinary actions taken against individual CFP professionals, they don't include disclosures that are publicly available on FINRA and SEC websites. The reporter claimed to find about 6,000 CFP professionals who have no CFP board discipline or bankruptcy disclosure on CFP board sites, but who have negative disclosures on the FINRA site. We don't agree with all their findings. For example, the article made many comparisons between CFP board and FINRA, yet CFP board is a very different organization from a government agency or self-regulatory organization like FINRA but at the same time, the article raised some very important issues, and I want to share with you some of the things that we're doing now. But before I share what we're doing in response to the article's criticism, I want to talk about the vetting that we do when somebody becomes certified. We refer to the requirements for becoming certified as the four E's, education, examination, experience, and ethics. We have processes in place to make sure people satisfy each of these requirements, and many people don't make it through the requirements to become certified. With education, each year we have thousands of people start the education process, participating in the programs, but never complete them. You know, Susan, we were just talking with Dr. Mary Kay Swedberg, who, ha who um, is responsible for the relationships now with 216 different colleges and universities mm -hmm. and you know it's it's one of the it is, it's one of the things that we know we have people who start the program who never get all the way through we would like more of them too but we just uh, you know people realize it might CFP might not be for them yeah, and it, I, we would like more, more people to go through and we'd like more people to realize what a great career financial planning is and put it on their radar first and foremost with the exam, about 38% of candidates fail the exam and never become certified. With experience, about 500 people each year fall out of the five-year time frame for completing the experience requirement. And ethics involves a background check with candidates for CFP certification who have engaged in conduct that may reflect adversely upon the profession of CFP marks and are required to demonstrate their fitness for CFP certification. You know, this is one of the issues, Susan, if I might, that, you know, look, uh, uh, were we pleased with Jason's article? No. And I think, you know, the opportunity to tighten things up uh, will, will is largely in those people once they become certified. The process to become CFP certified, I think, you know, those steps are well spelled out and the opportunities for improvement uh, lie within those areas once an individual has become certified. Well, thank you for that, Kevin. You know, I think the article really gave us kind of a kick that we needed to accelerate the work that we were already doing in updating all of our processes in, um, excuse me, <coughs> to take effect with the new code and standards. Here you can see the list of conduct deemed unacceptable for our fitness standards for candidates and individuals eligible for reinstatement. 
If we find any of these matters when conducting a background check for a candidate, <coughs> they're not allowed to become certified. And if this type of conduct takes place after someone becomes certified, our disciplinary rules call for an automatic interim suspension <coughs> of CFP certification. We have a clearly defined process outlined in our disciplinary rules and procedures that's intended to be fair to the CFP professionals whose conduct comes under scrutiny and credible to the public. We take seriously our obligation to invest, to vet the individuals seeking to become CFP professionals, as well as addressing questionable conduct after individuals attain their CFP certification. They don't ha we don't have details <coughs> of the Wall Street Journal's research about the 6,000 records they cited. But if you look at broker check disclosures, many are complaints that did not result in any action by the firm or by a regulator. So what the Wall Street Journal pointed out was that we can no longer rely on self-disclosure once an individual is certified. That's a shame, but let me share what we've done to address that. First, we no longer primarily rely on CF profession, CFP professionals to disclose matters to CFP board. We continue to require CFP professionals to complete an ethics declaration as part of the renewal process. But now, we will be supplementing our review of the self-disclosed and disclosed information with a review of FINRA's broker check and the SEC's investment advisor public disclosure database. We also now provide consumers with access to broker check and IAPD on the listings of current and former CFP professionals on our website. In addition to the links, we provide notes about the types of additional information that can be found in those databases. We are also exploring opportunities to use technology to assist us in conducting more thorough background checks. This would help support our background check and review processes immensely. There may also be some opportunities to provide links to a specific individual's information on broker check alongside the CFP board disciplinary information we currently make available on our website. Perhaps most importantly, the Board of Directors has created an independent task force. The task force has been charged with examining our enforcement practices and making actionable recommendations to strengthen and modernize them. They will be looking at the full enforcement process from background checks through investigations and hearings to the way we publicize outcomes and the information that we share on our website listings. The task force has been asked to balance the need to be thorough with the desire to be prompt in taking action and with a goal of presenting recommendations to the board at its meeting this November. And we will be sharing the task force recommendation publicly. You have to know that we probably will not be seeing the task force recommendations until shortly before our board meeting. So while many may expect that we make this public immediately, the board needs an opportunity to digest and understand the recommendations and to develop a plan to move forward with implementation. We couldn't have asked a better person to lead this effort. The chair of the new task force is Denise Boyd Crawford. We know her as Denny. We know her as Denny, and Denny is a securities consultant who served 17 years as the Texas Securities Commissioner. She is currently a public member of our board of directors, and she was given the authority to assemble and conduct this task force with full independence. We're pretty pleased with the impressive individuals that she's pulled together for the task force all of whom bring experience, integrity, and forward-thinking approaches to this important task. Denny did ask us to not ask her to put together a task force again in the month of August because it was impossible to find people. 
Some of you may recall that we released a draft of proposed procedural rules for public comment at the end of last year, and the board has received a proposed final version. Given the mandate of our new task force, we have placed that process on hold until we see if changes need to be made based on the task force recommendations. So we look forward to receiving those recommendations and sharing them with you. I want to assure you that CFP Board is committed to a strong and credible enforcement process. Our periodic surveys of CFP professionals have consistently said that enforcing the standards for CFP certification is one of our highest priorities for CFP Board. The Board of Directors values your feedback and we take seriously our responsibility for enforcing our standards. Our ethical standards and their enforcement processes really give value and meaning to CFP certification and they have played a significant role in making CFP certification a preeminent financial services certification for advisors, their firms, and the public. With our new code and standards taking effect next month, we've raised the bar not only for CFP certification, but also financial planning and financial advice. It has never been more important to provide the public with the confidence that their CFP professional is trained, tested, and committed to doing what's right for them. Now let me turn things over to Jack, who can share updates on our work to implement the new Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct. Thank you, Susan. It was March of 2018 when we announced the adoption of the new Code of Ethics and Standards of Conduct with an effective date of October 1st, 2019. You know, that date meant that we provided an 18-month period between the announcement of the new code and standards and their effective date, which was done to be responsive to concerns expressed by a number of CFP professionals and the firms they work for who requested a reasonable window of time to adjust their current operational systems in order to be accountable for the new code and standards. In July of this year, the board adopted an enforcement date of June 30th, 2020. We, we want all CFP professionals to read, understand, and comply with the new code and standards by the October 2019 effective date. And the enforcement date allows more time for CFP professionals and firms to adjust before the new code and standards are enforced. That date also aligns with the SEC's enforcement date of its regulation best interest package, which allows our CFP professionals and their firms to adapt to the new standards from CFP board and the SEC at the same time. Since the new code and standards was adopted, CFP board staff and our standards resource commission have been working on guidance materials to help CFP professionals and their firms understand and comply with the new requirements. And they've done a really terrific job. You see here the variety of materials that have been developed in a range of formats. All of these guidance materials are available to you on our website at cfp.net backslash code. Two of the newer guidance documents are the Roadmap to the Code and Standards and the Case Studies Applying the Code and Standards. The Roadmap is really a collection of reference guides. It includes a summary chart outlining a CFP professional's responsibilities. There are also guides about what, when, and how to make disclosures to clients. And there are also compliance guides to help understand the distinctions between financial advice and financial planning and how to comply with the requirements for both. Our Standards Resource Commission really did an excellent job on this document, which covers important details in a very easy to understand way. We knew when we adopted the code and standards that it would be important to find ways to present the new information in a variety of ways to make it accessible and to make it easy to understand. The roadmap does that by presenting key elements of the code and standards in an infographic style like the page you see here. 
It also includes disclosure guides and compliance checklists that present clearly some steps you can take to comply with the new code and standards. And earlier this month, CFP Board mailed out a copy of the roadmap to all current CFP professionals. If you haven't received your copy yet, please keep an eye on your mailbox. The case studies resource also brings the code and standards to life. The 12 case studies provide real-world examples of interactions between CFP professionals and their clients that demonstrate how the new standards apply to different situations. Each case study provides a specific factual situation and asks a question about the CFP professional's actions or duties under the new code and standards. The fact pattern ends with a question followed by a list of potential answers and an identification of the best answer with the rationale for why that answer is the best and the others are not. The new code and standards are so important to CFP board, the profession, and the public. If you or your firm have questions about them, please don't hesitate to get in touch with CFP board. We want all of our CFP professionals to be confident that they understand and are in compliance with the new code and standards by the October 2019 effective date. You know, Jack, I was at um, the Insiders Forum last week, and I had a lot of compliments. We received a lot of compliments on the roadmap, people telling me how important it was, that guidance was, how easy it was to understand, and and plan to um, uh, uh, develop action plans for their firms based on the guidance in the roadmap. So. You know, this is a, this is an important issue, and, and Susan, you've made this on on multiple occasions. You're a fee-only financial planner, and sometimes even the fee-only community has felt that they don't need to make changes for our new standards. You know, as you've worked through it, you had to, there were a number of things you had to do. Yeah, quite a number of things, and in fact, as I um, develop a financial planning process in the new firm in which I'm involved, uh, we are going to be following the roadmap very closely in developing our processes and our standards for practice. Great. Well, both Jack and Susan, thank you both. I also want to note that the new code and standards also has an impact on those who are working toward but have not yet achieved CFP certification. As Susan referenced earlier, we have many thousands of individuals who are currently working to complete the requirements for initial CFP certification. Those who still need to pass the CFP exam will find that it now includes questions on the new code and standards. In fact, we had a question, one of the people writing in asks, will the new code and standards be reflected on the November 2019 exam. Mm -hmm. Paul writes in and asks that question, and Paul, the answer is yes, it will indeed. Um, those who still need to satisfy the experience requirement will find that the activities they report must align with the new seven steps. For years, it's been six, the six-step financial planning process and with this change, it was uh, there is now an additional step. While the new steps are closely aligned with those in the current process, the seven steps breaks out identifying and selecting goals as a distinct step separate from the step of understanding a client's personal and financial circumstances through gather, gathering and analyzing client information. Candidates who are near to completing all of their requirements will also find that the new certification application references their obligation to comply with the new code and standards. Setting and administering the standards for CFP certification is our core business. CFP board benefits the public through our CFP professionals, and as the public's need for financial planning grows, it is important that we have sufficient numbers of CFP professionals to provide that service. In addition to our ethical standards, 
we have standards for each of the four E's that Susan has mentioned earlier. One of the primary ways CFP Board helps ensure that the CFP certification requirements are relevant is by establishing our list of principal knowledge topics and domains. Those lists make up the content of our curriculum within the CFP Board registered programs and the exam blueprint. They also serve as the basis for the parameters for topics that we will accept for continuing education credit. Every five years or so, we conduct a major research study that leads to the, the development of an updated list of principal knowledge topics. We are gearing up to conduct our next practice analysis next year. The practice analysis serves as the foundation for our certification. And our CFP board practice analysis is the nation's largest financial planning survey. The purpose is to develop and validate tasks and knowledge related to the work performed by those of you CFP certified. It also helps us develop the test specifications and provide a basis for our registered programs. The practice analysis involves subject matter experts, educators from registered programs, an analysis of emerging trends in the profession, and a large-scale survey. For the first time, the 2020 practice analysis will include surveys of financial services firms who hire CFP professionals, as well as clients representing the public. We look forward to seeing what new topics and areas of emphasis come out of this comprehensive study. So as we've looked at ways to ensure there is an adequate supply of CFP professionals to meet consumer demand for financial planning, one thing that we've heard over the years is the need for a better defined career path in financial planning. To help with that, our Center for Financial Planning recently put out a great new guide called Financial Planning Career Paths, Building More Sustainable and Successful Businesses. The guide highlights the importance of clear and transparent career advancement to attract, but I would suggest more importantly, to retain the next generation of financial planners. It provides a structure designed to help firms establish and effectively communicate those paths. And for each rung, the guide elaborates on the requisite skills, experience, and responsibilities necessary to achieve it. I encourage all of you to take a look at the guide, especially those of you who may be involved in creating positions or roles within your firms. Regardless of where you are in your own career, I think you'll find the guide a helpful reference when you speak to young planners or those considering a career in financial planning. It can help give you, it can help give them rather, clarity about the path. Susan, I know you've looked at it. You're using it in your firm. Any feedback on the document? Well, you know, that's it's another wonderful piece that uh, the center has put out, and we've had a lot of uh, people tell us what a great, um, what a great piece that is. And uh, you know, just another kudo for the center and the and the wonderful things that they're doing for uh, workforce development. We also hope you'll consider getting involved on a, a personal level with the center. Uh, we've seen that candidates who are engaged with others are more motivated and successful in completing the path to certification, whether that engagement is with their fellow candidates or with experienced CFP professionals. The CFP Board Mentor Program is helping connect candidates with CFP professionals who can help them along in the process. The program grew significantly over the last year, and now there are nearly 1,400 mentors working with more than 2,000 mentees who are on their way to CFP certification. 
And again, I encourage those of you who are already certified to consider signing up to be a mentor. And being a mentor doesn't mean a major time commitment. We see engagements lasting anywhere from a few weeks to up to six months. Mentoring relationships can be productive, even if they're comprised of only a few hours or a few conversations encouraging people along the way. Please consider signing up. I also encourage you to take advantage of the resource in the, at the CFP Board Career Center as you can consider your own career path or assist others in developing theirs. The Career Center was launched in 2015, and it's been very successful. Over 3,000 employers have registered to post jobs and internships on the site. There are 14,000 plus job seekers uh, profiles on the site. Now, 3,200 of them have resumes that are searchable, and yet there are more than 10,000 who perhaps don't want their boss to know that they're looking for a job and are just sitting back watching. So the Career Center is, again, a great resource. We're posting uh, dozens of jobs each month on an average close to 70 jobs. We'll have an online career fair next week on September 26th. It's a great opportunity for financial professionals and employers to connect online in real time. If your firm is looking for new talent or if you're looking for a new professional opportunity, we hope that you would be involved in that. Well, Jack and Susan, it's time to go. This is the fun part. Uh, it's time to go to uh, the questions. So why don't we jump right in? Again, as if you didn't hear me in the beginning, if we don't get to your question, uh, CFP board will follow up with you. Why don't, Susan, why don't we go first to you? Michael writes, I have heard that the board has considered a special status for longtime members who now have retired to maintain their uh, membership, I think he means their certification, at reduced cost. Where do we stand on this issue? And as I'm looking, there was a, I think we have a couple questions that have come in on this same category. Ben asks a similar question. He's suggesting that we consider creating a CFP retired category that would indicate CFP that the individual certificate is no longer providing professional services. So, Susan, if you would take that. Well, thanks, Michael, for asking that question. We actually introduced the CFP Board Emeritus Program late last year. CFP Board Emeritus membership is exclusively available for retired, non-practicing financial planners who have held CFP certification for at least 25 years. We currently have about 200 in individuals with the CFP Board Emeritus status, and we've been reaching out to eligible individuals with information about the program and individuals who are eligible for the program will find information about applying within their CFP board account information on the website. That's great. Thank you, Susan. Jack, next question for you. Mark asks, will there be sample code and of ethics documents provided that can be used with new clients or prospects? Thank you, Mark. It's a good question and happy to say yes. Uh, Kevin's team is in fact working on having consumer focused publications and resources for the new code and standards. And we expect to have those available closer to the June 30th, 2020 enforcement date for the code and standards. They will be accessible on our website at cfp.net backslash code along with other guidance resources. Great, thank you, Jack. Uh, Jim asks, what type of marketing plan is defined for 2019-2020? I think he's talking about the public awareness campaign. 
And just a reminder, uh, the board started the campaign in 2011. And of your uh, CFP board certification fee, $145 of the $355, $355 goes directly for the campaign. So it's about $12 million a year that we spend to advertise CFP certification. The uh, While we have online and uh, web advertising, Facebook and other digital presence all year long, the bulk of the campaign it runs in uh, the first of the year. We find the seasonality of a time when people might be preparing their taxes or getting ready to pay their taxes is a time that people are, are thinking about their finances. So we typically launch in uh, early to mid-February and run through tax day with the heavy TV flight. But those of you who are familiar with the campaign know that we have a radio presence on both National Public Radio and CBS Radio Sports. So that uh, is also in the spring. We'll begin that campaign on radio again this fall as well. So again, we try to have coverage throughout the year with a digital presence heavy up on TV the first two or three months of the four months of the year, February, March, and April, and then uh, a radio flight to come in in the end. So, Jim, thank you for that You question. know, Kevin, as we were developing this campaign, we had a number of focus groups that came in and, uh, and uh, talked to us about uh, financial planning, financial planners, financial advisors, and all kinds of different topics. And one of the things that really resonated with us was the fact that people still really didn't understand what a financial planner can do for them. And so that's one of the things that we tried to address in um, the new campaign. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Susan, you know, you talked about enforcement, and uh, we have a question uh, uh, coming in from Ken. Ken asks, uh, as you reevaluate CFP Board's approach to enforcement, do you expect certificates under the new code and standards will be subject to a more rigorous enforcement regime than CFP Board has maintained in the past? I think that's implicit in our our um, investigation of our current procedures, and we will be taking the recommendations of the independent task force, which I think are are uh, looking at exactly that. Great. Um, Here's a question, Susan. Uh, since uh, you were, you've been involved in implementing the new code and standards uh, at your firm, uh, Hubert asks uh, or says, "I think I understand how the new code and standards affects the CFP professional. Can you give a practical example of how they might impact a firm?" Well, you know, that's a really interesting question and one that we have a lot of conversation around. And while the standards actually are designed for individual certificates and not for a firm, we hope that the firms will support their certificates in adhering to the new code and standards. Great. Uh, next question. Paul asks, what efforts are being made to expand ex assistance and resources to CFP board registered education programs? And I, Paul, I'm not sure what, what you're asking for. As I mentioned, we have currently 216 colleges and universities. Uh, and I, we, we work very closely with uh, those colleges and universities. But if, if you think about a long-term vision, and we've been we've talked about this at uh, at the board of directors level. You know, we 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 think that career path to financial planning uh, is ripe for additional discussion and and clarification. I can tell you that our statistics of those people who become 
CFP certified, uh, only 10% of them graduate from a degree program, meaning a traditional degree program. The rest of them are either career changers later in the year or um, they are already working as a financial advisor. And so our hope would be that over time, uh, we would be able to um, increase that number and and really uh, make uh, make that number more like the like the accounting profession. Jack, let's well, we should talk maybe a minute about uh, thinking about how do we what can CFP board do to promote financial planning as an attractive career choice. Yeah. Yeah, sure, Kevin. Thanks. Um, I, I'd start by saying it's going to take more than just the CFP board to to accomplish this. But I always think about this in in three steps. One is high school students. By the time they're starting to think about what colleges they're going to, what majors they're interested in, they need to be aware of what a career in financial planning looks like. And those of us who have been client-facing practitioners know how fulfilling and rewarding it can be, yet that awareness is presumably very low. We actually don't have a great baseline on that, but that's something that we're working towards. So that's one thing we're going to have to accomplish is to raise the awareness among high school students. Secondly, as Kevin mentioned, the registered programs will continue to uh, need to be expanded into more colleges and universities and become more of a core curriculum within those schools. And then third, and equally important, there needs to be career opportunities coming out of the colleges and universities. And more, I would say, more apprenticeship type opportunities similar to other professions as opposed to what many of us would suggest um, was, has often been backwards, which is starting with sales and then getting into, you know, technical and client service aspects. So all three of those things are a work in progress. They're not going to, um, it's not going to happen overnight, but CFP board and many of its partners are focused on further developing that path. Well, and look, this is a long-term effort, right? We're filling a funnel. And if you think about filling that funnel, you know, starting at the high school level, you know, this is, that's not a, you know, that's not a small endeavor. And so I know it's the kind of thing as CFP board begins to update its five-year strategy, Jack, under your leadership in 2020, it's the kind of thing that I would imagine we might be talking about. It will, it will very likely be a point of emphasis in our forward-looking strategy. There you Agreed. go. <laughs> All right. Well, Jay writes, I'm interested in whether there is a presentation that I'd be able to give uh, to the community as a representative of the financial services industry. Um, you know, uh, he, you know, and he's talking about if I'm out and I want to talk about financial planning. Jay, we have resources available. A couple things I would point you to. Our Consumer Guide to Financial Planning has material that would be great for a presentation like this. It covers why it's important to have a financial plan, how to get started in financial planning, how to choose a financial planner, and you can download a copy from the marketing toolkit section of CFP Board's website. Now, if you're speaking at a class and you have internet access, I'm going to point you to CFP Board's uh, section, a part of CFP Board's Center for Financial Planning, and specifically the I Am a CFP Pro campaign. These are a uh, uh, short, a uh, couple of minute long, different vignettes of actual CFP professionals. They are uh, well-produced videos that highlight essentially a day in the life of a financial planner. They highlight why an individual might choose to be involved, or at least those planners that we feature, how they, uh, how, why they became CFP certified. 
And again, uh, the website where you can look at those videos, they're available on YouTube, but you could go directly there at cfppro.org. Uh, let's see, let's go to the, let's go to the, um, uh, uh, let's to answer, this a quick question here. I might have said something that caused some, uh, might have, I want to make sure we're clear. Uh, Marcy or Mars, I think it's probably Marcy, asks, did I hear you correctly that only about 10% of the CFP professionals have attained a bachelor's degree? No, that's <laughs> not what you heard. What I said was everybody has to complete a CFP board registered program. And if I wasn't clear, there are several different paths to completing that program. You can complete a degree program, and about 10% of our people have completed a financial planning degree program. There are other paths, though. We have certificate programs, which most people complete, and, uh, and we also have people who uh, may already be a CHFC or a CFA charter holder or an attorney or a certified public accountant, and they can uh, follow our accelerated path and just take the capstone course and then prepare for the exam. So Marcy, thank you for that. A, a more succinct answer might be that a bachelor degree has been required for Since CFP. Since 2007. Yes, yes. So, But currently only 10% of the uh, New new initial certificate come from a bachelor's degree program at a college. A financial planning, planning. bachelor's degree program. Correct. All right. Now that we have that straight. William asks, will I be able to maintain my CFP certification if I'm selling a product? The new code and standards doesn't prohibit commissions or require CFP professionals to be fee only. CFP board is compensation neutral, and we recognize that all CFP professionals can act as a fiduciary regardless of whether they receive fee or sales-related compensation. The most important thing is to do what is the right thing to do for your client. So regardless of the compensation type, when a CFP professional provides financial advice, the CFP professional must inform the client how the CFP professional their firm, and any related party are compensated for providing the products and services. That gives the, that gives the client an opportunity to evaluate um, what they're getting for their money. A CFP professional also must not make any false or misleading representations regarding the method of compensation of the CFP professional or their firm. Great. Thank you, Susan. Jonathan asks, will CFP board mail the case studies to certificate uh, to CFP professionals? If not, can I request one from the website? Look, uh, we have 85,000 CFP professionals. When we mail something out, it's six figures uh, plus. We think that the internet is the best delivery method. Now, we did just mail out the code and standards and the roadmap because they thought we thought they were so important. But generally, we distribute online, and I would direct you, Jonathan, to uh, cfp.net slash code, uh, and you can, there's a, a, all of our guidance resources are available there. And uh, uh, again, I'm I'm very proud of what the uh, Standards Resource Commission, the guidance that they've created under the, um, under the leadership of the chair of the commission, Blaine Aiken, and working with our CFP board uh, staff. Uh, Jared asks, we're coming down here, we have time for just a few more questions. Jared asks, what are, what are you all doing? I wonder where he's from. What are you all doing <laughs> to work with firms that don't consider themselves a fiduciary? Will we have to affiliate with a new firm if we want to keep the certification? 
No, Jared, as I said earlier, we hope that your firm is going to support your efforts to adhere to the code and standards. And we've been working very hard with firms to provide them with the guidance necessary to do that. You know, there, there's been a lot of media, though, out there. Our firm's going to support CFP certification. We have a whole corporate relations team here at CFP Board that's really on the, you know, out there working on the ground, boots on the ground, working with firms. And while, uh, you know, there's been speculation that this firm or that firm may or may not support CFP certification, we still haven't heard uh, of any firm that has asked their CFP professionals uh, to relinquish their certification. And if you work for a firm, that's asking you to relinquish your certification, uh, the CFP Board Career Center would be a great place to start your job search for a firm that would would support you. Is that too blatant, Jack? Jack's laughing at me. Is, are we being too too direct? I, I think that's the right message. All right. I think I might be biased. I might have a conflict, but we uh, hope that... Uh, we hope that you would uh, uh, find a way, and I think we're working, uh, the conversations we're having with firms uh, are, uh, we're, work, we've, we've, we're working, and I think in, in almost every case, in every case that I know of, we, we're working for a pathway forward for implementation. Uh, maybe one final, one or two final questions as we come up to the top of the hour. Uh, Massimilano, I think is the name. Great information, thank you. On the task force, is there anyone on the task force, the independent task force on enforcement with experience from the point of view of a CFP professional? Well, as a matter of fact, there is um, one person, uh, Richard Salmon is a former chair of CFP board and also a former chair of the Financial Planning Association, and uh, he was elected because he's someone in, that uh, most people are acquainted with, and his ethics are above reproach. Great. And Jack, I'll, I'll, we'll make this the last question for you as chair of the nominating committee. We have an individual who asks, for someone seeking a future seat on the board of directors, what can they do to strengthen their application? Well, first off, I, I appreciate your, your interest in serving CFP board, so thank you for that. I would say um, all types of general leadership experience is helpful. I'd say other types of board, whether it's for-profit, non-profit, um, experience is, is also helpful. Uh, the other thing to consider is there are many other volunteer opportunities at CFP board that are not necessarily at the board of director level. There's always needs, that, for example, the disciplinary and ethics commission, exam writers, and, and the like, and all that information is on, is on the website. So, um, you know, we, we, we definitely value individuals who have made ongoing contributions to the financial planning profession, um, and we certainly value individuals who bring leadership and, and uh, broad perspective that might help us on the board one day. You know, I'm so glad you said that, Jack, because we have hundreds of volunteers that do uh, all kinds of different things for us, as you mentioned. And, you know, they're kind of the unsung heroes of CFP certification. And thank all of you who have volunteered for a board or a committee or as an exam writer or anything that you've done for us. Thank you so much. Great. Well, we're just about out of time. Susan, what parting words would you like to share with us? I think we're at a very exciting time in our journey towards a recognized profession. And uh, I look forward to the years ahead to see exactly the changes that are made. I've been involved in the profession myself for quite a long period of time. And I see a lot of positive things happening. And I am 
just as excited today as I was in 1989 when wow. I became a CFP <laughs> professional. You know, this is an exciting year for CFP Board. We're celebrating the 50th year of the founding of the profession. So maybe you might say a little bit more about that. Well, sure. It was December 12th, 1969, that an important meeting took place in Chicago. Thirteen men, yes men, involved <laughs> with different parts of the financial services industry. I think they were life insurance salesmen. I Not that there's anything wrong been. with that, but I believe they were insurance salesmen, most of As them. They met in a hotel near Chicago's O'Hare Airport for a discussion that set the groundwork for the financial planning profession that we know today. And CFP Board will be doing some special things to celebrate this anniversary to honor the many accomplishments that the financial planning and financial advice communities have achieved over the past five decades and to embrace the ongoing evolution of financial advice. We look forward to involving the CFP professional community in that celebration and celebrating the milestone throughout the coming year. So keep an eye out for more details. Great. Thank you, Susan. Jack? Yeah, I, if you stop and I think the, the financial planning professional has really come a long way over these past 50 years. And I just want to thank the CFP professional community for the continued support of the CFP certification. And I certainly want to encourage all of you to take advantage of the great resources that are available on the new code and standards. This is obviously something that's very important to all of us and to the financial planning profession. We here at CFP Board are completely committed to helping CFP professionals and the profession understand and comply with the new code and standards. And again, the enforcement date for the new code and standards is June 30th, 2020, but it becomes effective on October 1st of this year. So it's important for you as CFP professionals to live into our responsibilities and our fiduciary promise to the public. It truly has never been more important for the public to be confident that their CFP professional is trained, has been tested, and can be trusted to do what's right for them. Great, I share Susan and Jack's appreciation for the support of CFP professionals. And thank you both and the entire board for their leadership and commitment to CFP certification. You've heard today about many of the initiatives that are made possible only with the involvement of CFP professionals and our many other stakeholders. CFP board has many volunteer opportunities that provide meaningful and rewarding ways to give back to the profession. I encourage you to consider participating in those activities and to reach out to us when you have questions or comments about our work. In closing, thank you all for joining us today for today's webinar. A recording of this presentation will be posted to CFP Board's website within the next week, and CFP Board will follow up individually with those of you who asked questions we did not get to during this broadcast. Again, thank you very much from Washington, D.C. and the headquarters of CFP Board, and have a nice afternoon, everybody.